Hello and welcome along to the Property Academy podcast. I'm your host, Ed McKnight. And I'm Andrew Nicholl. And today on the show, we're talking about how to go hard and go early in property investment. Now, this comes from a listener of the show who says, hey guys, I've been thinking about this. How would you apply our current government's go hard, go early approach to property investment? Now, I realized after... I thought about this and wrote down some notes that perhaps this list of the show really meant in terms of regulation of property investors. But what we're going to talk about is if you are a property investor and you want to go hard and go early, what would you actually do in that instance? Now, Andrew, I want to get your take on this, but I first want to ask you, do you and your do you think that you went hard and early yourself? So Ed asked me this off air, which was quite confusing to me because I'm still at the tender age of 36. So I thought I was still in the early stages of property investment, which he just laughed in my face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so so uh, look. Absolutely, I guess is the the short answer. I, I was probably uh, my own worst enemy when I started investing because I talked myself out of every deal that I'd come across, uh, and I was I was just too cautious. I mean, I still managed to get started at nineteen, so I wasn't that bad. But I but I absolutely did talk myself out of a few good deals that could have made me a lot of money. Um, and I guess probably in the early stages, my big strategy was save. Before I found a property, I just wanted to save more money, and so I'd save every possible dollar that I could, and I'd do everything I could to make an extra buck and that's what actually Andrew I remember as well you once said to me that you paid some measly sum for board as well what was that I I think I paid John and Marie Nicol $50 a week and that was you know all inclusive so you so you had power um uh, but remember back in those days you had to get on a treadmill for the power so I'd I'd bike on the treadmill for two hours a night and then it would power the black and white tv but yeah no I I paid $50 a week uh for, for all inclusive board um my children will not get away with it quite so lucky and so um yeah I was save every bit of money that I could. I didn't buy a car until I was 18. Uh, and that, actually, to be fair, that was when I got my license. Uh, I got my, car, uh, got my car and I bought my license or a little bit thereafter and I only got a license so I could go to a bar and have a beer. Um, so, so um, yeah, I, I, had, I didn't have much in the way of expenses. Uh, I, had, I had a good job at the BNZ and so I was able to save most of my money. The other thing you need to do is you need to build your equity. So when you're in that planter stage, you need to be able to build that equity really quickly because you want to be able to repeat the process. So the way you do that is renovations uh, and, and uh, you know give every last um, bit of time that you've got. I mean, I, I wasn't working for myself back then, so I actually had a life. So that that life I'd use to go and renovate property and, and uh, uh, clear the gardens and all those kind of things. And then smash down your personal mortgage. If you are in that planter stage and you've got a personal mortgage, you need to, uh, you know, renovate your own house as well, as well as investment if you've got that. Um, but you need to try and pay down your personal debt as quickly quickly as possible. And I always say, make sure you do that with the ability to redraw. So I know I've spoken about that before, but for any new listeners, don't pay extra money into your mortgage without having the ability to redraw it again. Because if you do, and the bank's policy changes, the only way you can get that money back is sell the property because it's not liquid. So using things like offset mortgages or revolving credits, really important way to kind of create that equity increase. One thing I do want to just jump in and say as well, just for anybody who hasn't listened to an episode recorded probably about one or two weeks ago, that's just the planter stage that Andrew is talking about now is a a model based on three different stages of life. We call the the first stage planting in terms of your financial life, where you're trying to build some equity, growing, where you've got some equity that you've already um, built up and you want to take that further by investing in potentially lots of properties and then the harvesting stage which is where you've got some equity and you want to live off the proceeds of that so that's that's the planter stage when you're kind of sub 30 sub 35 depending on the stage where you're trying to build up some equity Um, otherwise would certainly recommend uh, listening back to that episode or Picking out the the article in Juno Investing Magazine, which I know you explained that one as as well, Andrew. And what some of the, I'm just wondering, some of the 
investors that you've been working with, what's are there any instances where you've been really impressed with people who have gone hard and gone early as young people? Uh, yeah, actually, well, um, Derry, who's just recently come on as a, one of our property partners in Auckland, um, he came to me uh, as a as an investor first. So he came to me uh, with his partner. Um, they had saved a substantial deposit. So they were the kind of, they, these are, and I think we're going to have Derry or, or, or someone um, he knows on the show talking about living a um, affordable lifestyle, basically living on the smell of an oily rag, something that um, I, I couldn't do or Ed couldn't do quite the same way as these guys. Um, uh, his, his partner, I think I've, I said this on one of the previous shows, his partner lives on something like, I don't know, $4 a week on food. She, she lives cheaper than the kids in Africa. She's amazing. $4 a week. Oh, no, that's an exaggeration, but it, it just, you know, amazing money. So they'd saved so much. And then when they came to see me, um, their big realisation was actually that money in the bank's really inefficient and so uh, after after a meeting with me um, they ended up doing due diligence on three rental properties I'm sure you won't mind me telling you this uh, <laughs> all 30,000 of you uh, and uh, he ended up buying all three of them because they want to actually go really hard in their investment and now um, whilst planning a wedding they're figuring out how they save even more money for their deposits and, and because those properties are not due for completion for another 12 months they'll be creating equity before they've even settled a property. So yeah, that's that's a good example of someone that is very close to the business. Now, what the other thing you can do if you're maybe at a later stage, so maybe you've owned your property for a while, you might be in your early 40s, maybe late 30s. Uh, well, I mean, even early 50s is not that old really in the grand scheme of things. But you might be in that grower stage. So you've got some equity, you've built it up over time because you've paid off your mortgage or you've owned some property for, for a time and it's gone up in value. Now, just because you're later in, in life um, doesn't, and I don't, I don't mean that in an offensive way, you always got to be careful what you say around this, but, but because you're not in that planter stage, you can still go hard and go early in terms of property investment if you need to build up some assets in order to be able to live a comfortable retirement lifestyle or build up that passive income. What would somebody do if they're in that grower stage, Andrew, and wanted to go hard and go early? I think probably um, if you are going to go hard and it is relatively new to you, um, do your research um, and and you know partner with someone. It doesn't have to be a, necessarily a property partner like us, but at least surround yourself with a good bunch of professionals so that you are making really informed decisions, not just rash decisions. Because there is that life cycle uh, that that life cycle that we've talked about, where people do kind of get to um, s- somewhere between fifty five and sixty five, and they can start to panic. And I've seen people rush into investment decisions uh, that are poor when they are starting to panic. I just thinking of an investor that rang me um, about a year ago actually and um, they were really really concerned that they hadn't invested in property and then everyone else has had and they'd done some numbers on the back of an envelope and realized they were going to be broke in in you know uh, seven years when they retired and um, so so he and I sort of worked together for a while but the limitations that he put on himself because he was in such a panic to buy something that was there today meant that they missed out on a number of really good opportunities and 12 months later uh, they haven't really done anything and um, that's always a bit of a shame as well so you, you want to make sure that you're well informed and you're making really good decisions um, but don't make a, the first decision just because it's the first decision make an informed decision. And I think that in particular now was a great time to go hard and early. And it's because becoming a property investor or becoming a residential landlord is becoming harder. And what I mean by that is the Reserve Bank and the government are particularly planning to put restrictions in place that make it harder to acquire properties. Now, certainly there is some other legislation like Healthy Homes, RTA, potentially some changes to how accounting practices work that make it a bit more difficult once you become a landlord to to be in the business of providing rental accommodation. But certainly where it is getting the hardest is in the acquisition stage of purchasing property, because that is what causes heat in the market and potentially pushes up house prices. And certainly from uh, from the government's perspective, stops first home buyers from, from accessing the property market. So certainly the government is making it harder for landlords in a lot of different ways, but the main way is in acquiring property. And 
And that's why I think it's important that investors do um, take action when they are able to, so that you're still able to acquire property in today's markets rather than in a few months time where it might potentially become harder. And it's quite interesting, Andrew, we've talked, I think, off air mainly, I don't think we've discussed this on the show before, um, that people will often ask, how do I buy 38 rental properties like yourself, Andrew, or they might see somebody who's got 15. I remember Nigel who came on the show who was talking about uh, going overseas and living off his rental property via revolving credit in order to fund that overseas experience. Um, you know, and he had 15 properties, and you know, which is a great number. Um, but the people often say, well, how do I get that many? And in most cases, am I right in saying you probably, it's not as easy as it used to be? No, absolutely. Look, um, previously you could borrow a far higher percentage and banks were a lot easier than they are today. And that's where, you know, uh, whilst, um, you know, if I look back at the, at the number of acquisitions I'd make in a year, whilst that used to um, be relatively low at the start, you know, I might buy one property a year or, or, or from 19 um, or, and then I'd get another one and it would be quite a slow uh, burn to begin with, but then it really started to take off. Now it, it sort of is more challenging. So, you know, I, I do have have quite a few properties under contract at the moment or, or uh, in construction at the moment, but it's not the same as, you know, uh, maybe four years ago where one every couple of weeks that I put under contract. So, you know, I was going really aggressive at times. And again, you know, I suppose there's a bit of uh, refinement of my portfolio over the last wee while. So because because of the healthy homes, I've got rid of stuff and then I've had to replace that. And, you know, then then the market's a little bit harder to find those good deals. And I always got to give the good deals to clients that are working with me first, which is always a bit of a pain. Uh, so, you know, you've, you, you do have... Um, limitations as time goes on and particularly because we are uh, led under a Labour government you are going to be under the spotlight as an investor. It is always going to be a bit more challenging in those times whilst we've got good interest rates you've got to still be able to get that money and with the with the 60% maximum LVR for an existing investment property it's really tough to recycle that deposit even if you're buying new and borrowing 80% if it's all linked in with other assets potentially that drops, well sorry it absolutely absolutely does drop to 60% after settlement and that can make it harder to get usable equity back out. And I guess actually that's probably one of the reasons why I stress to investors who are in a position to go hard and go early now to actually do that because you will regret the deal that you don't do. I guarantee you in five years time if you've thought about a deal now and you've decided not to do it you'll you'll be uh, you know looking at the price uh, later on and be wishing you had. So what I wanted to ask you then, Andrew, is well, sh what should people do if they're scared about the market or scared of more regulation which is coming in? Because I know we've had so many texts, emails, Instagram messages, Facebook messages all about this right now because – this is the year of regulation in terms of, of, of how the government is going to continue to regulate property investors. Should we be scared about that? Look, I guess uh, you've got to remember the only the only consistency in anything is change. And you've there, there is always going to be change in property like any other business. And if you're a good business person, you know how to, and God forbid I use this word, pivot. So you, you have to actually look at these, uh, ch these little challenges as opportunities opportunities as well. So when the bank brings in healthy homes and things like that, make sure you're buying the right pro sort of properties that are not going to cause an issue. Um, when they are bringing in LVR restrictions, buy a new property that's exempt. You you just use these as an advantage rather than a disadvantage. So you shouldn't be f fearful of them unless you're going to make you know ill-informed decisions. If you're an educated investor, then no issue whatsoever. Fantastic. Let's wrap it up there. But please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. It really does help us get the message out to more people. And hey, if you've got a topic that you'd like Andrew and I to talk about, like the listener of the show did for today's topic of Go Hard, Go Early, send us a text. Our number is 5522. Uh, whip out your phone, flick us a message. Or sometimes I know for whatever reason it doesn't work or you can't send um, pictures or images via via that text number. Um, just flick them to me personally. My email is ed at opuspartners.co.nz. It'd be great to hear from you. Thanks for listening to the Property Academy podcast. I'm your host, Ed McKnight. And I'm Andrew Nicholl. And we're going to be back again tomorrow with even more daily strategies, tactics and insights to help you get the most out of the New Zealand property market. Until next time. <laughs>